In the fall of 2021, Thinkers Lodge, in partnership with the Center for Local Prosperity, are bringing together 30 leading voices from both the nuclear and climate crises for deep and brave conversations in an environment of intergenerational partnership. This summit examines the two major existential threats for humanity in our current age. In 1955, Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell drafted a manifesto for nuclear scientists to gather to discuss curbing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. In 1957, the very first anti-nuclear meeting was held at the historic Thinker's Lodge in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. That pugwash movement continues today. The climate change issue, what we're confronting, it's impossible. It is beyond us. But then on the other hand, throughout history, the most interesting things have been in those moments in history when a people decided to do the impossible. And that's what we need to do now. And that's what we will do now. Hello, everyone. I'm Robert Cervelli. I'm the executive director for Center for Local Prosperity. Welcome to this one hour webinar discussion, our global climate, our human prospect. The discussion today is part of the pre-event, pre-summit events uh, to uh, a larger event that we'll be having uh, in late September, early October, entitled the Thinker's Lodge Summit on Nuclear and Climate Crises. We've gathered 24 thinkers, both regionally from across Atlantic Canada and internationally from as far away as Moscow to Vancouver to have deep and brave conversations about these two existential threats to humanity, climate change and the threat of nuclear weapons. These are being held both virtually and on site at the Thinker's Lodge, a national historic site in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. It's a very powerful location. It was made famous by a 1957 uh, conference that was held there where 20 nuclear physicists gathered from across the planet at the height of the Cold War when nuclear bombs were being built very quickly to see if they could stem that proliferation. It was a very successful meeting. Their work continues today with annual workshops and webinars and, some, and uh, conferences globally. That work was given a 1995 Nobel Peace Prize. That medal uh, was awarded both to the Thinker's Lodge and to Joseph Rotblatt, who was the lead uh, um, in those uh, early discussions and the subsequent work that followed. That Peace Prize is housed in the Thinker's Lodge today. If you have a chance, you haven't been there yet, you definitely should. It's definitely a go-to destination. So having gathered these thinkers, our goal is to interview all of them in one format or another. Today's webinar discussion, we have three of those thinkers there are others that are being interviewed in a written uh, feature article format. One of those is up on our website currently. There's two others to follow. Uh, there's one webinar that took place two weeks ago that will be posted there soon. And we have another one coming up uh, next week as well. Please follow our website, sign up for our newsletters to get all of the latest um, um, events that will be coming up. So it is my great honor today to have three of those thinkers with us, three very distinguished leaders. Uh, we're pleased to be able to host. Um, uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce Bill Rees. He is a population ecologist, an ecological economist, professor emeritus, and former director of the University of British Columbia School of Community and Regional Planning. He's a founding member 
and former president of the Canadian Society for Ecological Economics, a fellow of the Post Carbon Institute, and founding director of One Earth Initiative. Bill is best known as the originator and co-developer, along with his graduate students, of the ecological footprint analysis. So Bill knows how to use hard numbers that show definitively that the human enterprise is in a dysfunctional overshoot. Importantly, though, he also studies the biological and psychocognitive barriers to ecologically rational political behavior. Jim Abraham joins us today as well as he is a well-known meteorologist and has spent over 40 years studying weather, water, and climate. His work is taking him starting in Nova Scotia to work in Whitehorse, Montreal, and other parts of Canada. He's currently president of the Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society. Jim managed a wide variety of weather, water, and environmental research programs across the country, including meteorological research and observation programs. His most profound accomplishment is starting the Canadian Hurricane Forecast and Research Program. He assists municipalities, including African Nova Scotian and Indigenous communities, to understand and adapt to climate change and extreme weather. Shalini Kathir Gamanathan is a recent graduate from the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo, uh, graduating just this last spring. She demonstrates that rare passion found in youth today about wanting to understand the interplay between the many intricate systems that make the world we live in today. She's currently working as a junior planner for the Strategic Policy Branch at Environment Climate Change Canada. Her work has involved interviews about climate change with people from all walks of life during her graduate research work. She's interested in innovative and collaborative approaches to mitigating current environmental issues at a local and global scale. So today we have a one hour discussion, an open and honest discussion, I'm sure. You're welcome as attendees to submit questions in the uh, Q&A box. I will be keeping track of those and I will be working as best I can uh, to get those into our conversation. So please feel free to write your questions into the Q&A box. So Shalini, Jim and Bill, um, as I've thought about it earlier today, you know, um, some of the first warnings about climate change came out in uh, when the early 70s, I think, possibly earlier than that. Uh, we know that uh, Exxon, other large companies, other institutions knew about this. A lot of that work was held secret not disclosed to the public or actually even worked against. We know there's been countless meetings, agreements over those three to four decades uh, internationally uh, with governments and so on. And I remember narratives um, over the past years that would say we only have fill in the blank so many years to fix the climate change problem. But where are we now? We, I'm hearing the message, we're running out of time, or in fact, we've run out of time. So I'd like to open with that. Anyone would like to jump in and uh, start the conversation there in terms of our current situation with climate change. Jim, I was gonna let you do this because you're the climate guy, but. Go ahead. So the, the actual understanding of what we were doing to the climates started much longer, much previous to 1974. In fact, uh, several scientists in the early 1900s recognized that 
the growth of industry and industrial revolution and the amount of fossil fuel burning and in particular coal uh, was, was going to have a greenhouse gas effect. And so there were warnings many decades ago. And as advanced as society grew, population grew and industry grew and the greenhouse gases uh, grew, um, you know, Bill and I were talking about how the population 200 years ago was 1 billion and it took hundreds of thousands of years to get to that 1 billion. Of course, since that time, uh, 200 years, we've gone from 1 billion to 7.5 billion people who really rely on the burning of, of fossil fuels for this, um, this economy. The, the, the other big change is communications that's taking place. And for every positive communication, there's a miscommunication. And the manipulation of facts, the manipulation of stories that certainly uh, started with the tobacco companies, it, 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 those lessons learned were uh, basically um, uh, taken over by fossil fuel companies. You mentioned Exxon. And now, of course, any significant issue, whether it be vaccinations, or whether it be whatever political stripe, you political issue you want to um, talk about, is impacted by this whole communication and trust breakdown. And it's really unfortunate because, uh, and Bill can articulate this better than I, we're running out of time. And we're continuing to put enormous amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We've got 50% higher greenhouse gases in the atmosphere than what one would consider a normal atmosphere. When the concentration is half of normal, you get a nice age. We're 50% higher than normal. What are we gonna get? Nothing very good. And so, yes, we are running out of time. Um, and unfortunately, what we have to do is build and reestablish the trust that is broken down over, in my opinion, grief. I think one of the major problems we have to confront here is that society, all human beings, um, are really storytellers. We make up a story and we live out of that story as if it were reality. And right now, certainly since so of the late 70s, we've been globally engaged in a story dominated by something called neoliberal economics. Neoliberal economics is the primary, uh, I suppose, form of economics of capitalist societies, but it's really in various forms been taken over by all other major countries. And the problem is that it's a story about humans and society and the environment which contains absolutely zero useful information about the behavior of complex systems, such as the climate system or ecosystem, or for that matter, society. So we're in a situation in which we're trying to run the planet Earth, which is the ultimate of complex systems, using a model which contains no interesting information about the nature of planet Earth. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? And of course, everything is, is going off the rails for that reason. We have to understand that the, the two underpinning values driving neoliberal economics are maintenance of growth. It, it's primarily oriented toward a ways of using markets and technology to increase both economic and technological efficiency uh, so that we can get more and more out of less and less and therefore uh, maintain a growth trajectory. So if you just take two beliefs, and namely that growth can go on indefinitely, and secondly, that human ingenuity, technology, uh, can essentially obliterate any environmental constraints to growth, then you have a story in which there are no limits whatsoever to the scale of the human enterprise and to the so, growth model. So it, 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 it's growth and technology is our savior are the main narratives, is, is that the case? That's it. And so all of the other information 
that uh, you know you, you've been talking about the Exxon revelations back in the 70s, Jim Hansen's performance in the Senate in, in the 1980, early 80s, and none of this has made any difference. Because if you were to take it seriously, it would confound the primary narrative of, of techno-industrial society, that we must maintain growth at all costs. So I'll very quickly make the point that, look, we've had 26 major international conferences and six major agreements on reducing carbon emissions. And if you plot the time of those various conferences and agreements against the steadily upward ticking uh, concentration of carbon dioxide emissions and, and other greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, none of them have had the remotest effect. There's been no impact whatsoever. So what has won out over and over again is our dedication to the growth imperative and the idea that technology will save us. And that's where we're running right now. Thank you. Shalini, I've got a question related to that. With the work that you did at the university, um, you were <laughs> out speaking with people, counselors, yeah. townspeople, and so on. How does that narrative reside with the average people, uh, average person out there? So um, it's I, I'm enjoying this conversation about narratives and, and growth. And when we think about, um, like, even this whole discussion, what we were talking about in the 70s, me, my existence wasn't even like a concept in the 70s. I was born in like the late 90s, but we're somehow st still dealing with the same issues. And so um, something that I've kind of thought about in my research in terms of looking at how people perceive change specifically is that some on one hand look at change as an outcome of necessity. Uh, there's not enough food, so we're going to figure out uh, some type of, whether that's technology or some methodology of like agriculture, to fill in that gap. Um, so one side of things, you're seeing change as an outcome of necessity, while the other, uh, other side uh, of this um, perception is people understanding change as a spontaneous act of revolution. So we can see how these two understandings of how change occurs um, despite talking about climate change or climate action in this, in this realm of things, there's some type of conflict that's going on. Um, so when you talk about uh, gen the general public or people working uh, within climate action at the local scale, the narrative seems to be the same as we've been calling and calling on people to act, but um, it's a matter of uh, burnout, for example, in terms of barriers, uh, burnout and no cohesion. You have one group that's saying, okay, we have a problem here. And a group of people saying, we understand that there's a problem, um, but what do we do next? Um, so it's a matter of, um, we're at the stage, I feel like, where we're beyond even arguing whether climate change is human induced, whether it's actually occurring, but it's more of the fact that we are in a crisis right now. And that's where I feel like there's a lot of conflicting um, ideologies, opinions of whether this is a crisis, this is an emergency, understanding, um, having an understanding based on fact versus um, saying, okay, climate change is a thing, I can recycle tomorrow and everything will be better. So it's, it's interesting to talk about narratives and facts. And as we in, uh, we've increasingly learned that we're very social uh, society and social capital matters a lot too. So um, in terms of the work that's being done, it, is it appropriate for the scale, for the diversity of people? Um, so it, yeah, it's an important conversation talking about narratives. And I don't think that people um, necessarily take a moment to step back and reflect on that as they're doing the work that they're doing. And so we see a bit of gaps um, in that uh, reflective area. Yeah, when it comes to what narrative people are trying to um, share. Yeah, it's, um, and I wonder, Shalini, um, uh, Bill and Jim, how many people really within those narratives understand the true gravity of the situation that we have run out of time and, and what that means? You know, there's the word bandied about more and more that it's an existential threat. 
And I feel like people need to sit down and say, well, now, wait a minute, existential threat, let that sink in. The word means existence um, when you really think about it that way. And, and how many people, I just throw it out to, the, to uh, any one of you, really understand what that means in terms of the gravity of the predicament that we're in? Well, if I can say something, I don't think anyone does really. We're dealing with systems of such enormous complexity, the climate system, the ecosphere, uh, that no human mind can really wrap itself around the nature of the behavior of these kinds of systems. So that's the first point. The second point is we are naturally reductionist. We evolved in very circum uh, simple circumstances and tend to think in, in one or two dimensions at a time. So I'm gonna say something that many people will find offensive. Climate change is not the existential threat. Climate change is a symptom, along with biodiversity loss, ocean pollution, and dozens of others. The real existential threat, and this is what nobody understands, is something called overshoot. Human beings are using the products of nature, the, the productivity of ecosystems much faster than those systems can regenerate, and we're dumping wastes much faster than nature can assimilate it. And Climate change is a waste management problem because carbon dioxide is the single largest waste by weight of industrial economies. You cannot solve climate change by trying to solve climate change because everything we're attempting to do in that direction will make climate change worse and not address overshoot. So that's how little we understand of the problem. The only answer to overshoot is fewer people consuming less material and energy. It's Full stop. If you deal with that, you'll have solved climate change, ocean pollution, and many of the other issues. But as long as we keep focusing on symptoms, we're not going to solve the primary problem. Jim, you were uh, bouncing your head up and down there a number of times. Um, well, it's it's funny, and what 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 Bill's saying is bang on. And uh, um, I've been reading. I haven't got through uh, Mark Carney's book on values. But it's I just while while Bill was was uh, was uh, talking I just opened up a page and it says it says uh, Mark witnessed the collapse of public trust in elites globalization technology and the existential threat of growing climate emergency that's exactly the words he used and fundamentally. His, the conversation that Mark is having in this book, and I'm only a third of the way through, is how we um, rank the success of society is in a global domestic product or in the economy. And fundamentally, what Mark Carney is talking about is we need to revolutionize how we uh, measure um, value and value needs to be considering the well-being of the human race and the planet. And, and if I just go two lines down, um, he says, uh, he says the, the book sets out a framework for the change needed, an economic and social renaissance, embedding the values of sustainability, solidarity, and responsibility into decision-making. And fundamentally, I mean, he's, he's an economist. I'm a weather weenie. Um, I mean, this is, we have to fundamentally change the way, what we value. And, um, you know, while climate change is mentioned in the current political um, um, election, the election race, it's an aside because Fundamentally, the argument made to get votes is the economy. Um, jobs, jobs, jobs. And um, yeah, it's, it's not gonna, it doesn't work. Um, uh, it's, it's, and, and uh, back to this whole realization that we're in the middle of a climate emergency. And, you know, when I retired from Environment Canada, I said, well, what am I going to do? I said, well, I want to do the things I'm not allowed to do while I'm working for the government. Of course, I was working for Stephen Harper at the time, so 
I wasn't allowed to talk to the media and I wasn't allowed to talk about climate. In fact, climate was removed from a lot of the narrative. So those are the two things I said I was going to do. Media, climate. I mean, I'm a meteorologist since I wasn't that interested in the climate. I was mostly interested in extreme weather. However, once I started peeling the onion on the climate um, science, um, and I started, my first talk was, I was asked to talk to a bunch of old white guys at a golf course. And, and they looked at me and said, Jim, how come we don't know about this? Um, well, partly because they're not listening and probably because they're not, didn't fundamentally care but I talked about what's going to happen in 2100. I don't talk about what's going to happen anymore because it is happening. Every single morning I open up the electronic newspapers and I, I started with the Guardian in the, in the UK. There is always a half a dozen really, really good stories, scary stories, but you know, uh, well thought out stories on the climate emergency. And so, you know, I've said this before, uh, you know, when I had dinner with Catherine Hayhoe, who is a well-renowned climate scientist, but also a, 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 an award winner on communication. She was one of Obama's advisor. I said, Catherine, what can we do? She said, Jim, we got to talk about it. That's the start. And that's what we're doing today. And that really is an important component. That's the narrative, is talking about it. And so I said, okay, then what? She says, well, you build trust. You talk about it with your family. You talk about it with your friends. You talk about it with your faith community. You, you ultimately, we need to reestablish the broken trust. And her view is talking about it. Yeah. And that's effectively what we're doing today. Talking about it. Cellini, I'm curious. Um, you just came out of university a few months ago. Um, mm -hmm. Are students, are youth talking about it? What's going on generally? How many people, um, how many young people really get what's happening? Um. I'm, I'm going to uh, start off by saying I probably have a biased perspective on this because the people I'm, I was around uh, were studying the environment and consequences of climate change. So I want to say maybe comparatively, like in, from a historic point of view, there are a lot more youth that are concerned about what's going on and they're definitely talking about it. I think it's something that's kind of innate in the way uh, people are growing up and talking about issues in school specifically. I mean, you have um, the protests and the strikes for school that were happening, which is kind of a visual representation of how much this matters to youth now, because at this point of view, at this point in time, I think um, it's kind of alarming and it's kind of frustrating to hear leaders and politicians constantly say, oh, the future is uh, in the youth hands and like putting that responsibility on youth but not giving opportunity or not listening and it's not necessarily a matter, uh, a matter of listening but actually uh, contributing and providing action based on what they're hearing I think we're we're kind of over that and as um, mentioned earlier it, we're seeing the consequence we're observing and we're experiencing the consequences of climate change at this very moment i think this year um on top of the pandemic we have forest fires and flash floods and i think it was it's definitely even amongst family that used to like not want to talk to me about this stuff people are coming with concerns of climate anxiety and grief understanding how these extreme weather events for example are happening more and more often and um, I think, if anything, uh, it's not necessarily a wake-up call. I think the wake-up call has been, like, sounding alarms for a very long time. I think we've, we're just in, like, full gear at this, uh, at this point. Um, but uh, we were talking about values and responsibilities earlier, I think. Um, uh, it was mentioned, and it, it's interesting to talk about uh, why people are in this, why people who are doing... Uh, work within 
uh, climate change and climate action are doing it and understanding that it's not always the same reasons for some it might be they're doing it um, for on behalf of their children and their grandchildren for others it might be something that is tied with culture and beliefs and for others it just might seem like it, it's the only thing to do and it's kind of uh, I don't know um, whether that whether this is a good thing or a bad thing but I think we need to understand that the, this diversity in values also brings a diversity in why people feel responsible to take action. And we need to acknowledge that because it's not like a monolith of perspective and belief that um, everyone shares. But it, I think when we have that understanding in our conversations, it's easier to kind of have those discussions and build trust and um, kind of understand the importance of like uh, influence. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I just went on a tangent there, but I kind of wanted to pull that together. Um, and it reminded me of, um, a couple of the interviews that I was doing, um, where one interviewee had presented kind of the idea, um, that one of the barriers, uh, in doing work in this field is having to simultaneously unrig the system and provide solutions. Like, um, we talked, we chatted about earlier, climate, the climate crisis is a symptom of what is going on, what is an innate um, uh, issue of value. And I think that was exactly what it is. I feel like when we talk about the issue of the climate crisis and providing next steps or whatever it is, whether it's policy, whether it's um, action plans, we have to understand that it's, there's a disassembly that's necessary for us to assemble what is required. And I think there's some type of gap in understanding that that's required. And that's where we're kind of, um, I think that's where there's like a lot of miscommunication in terms of this narrative and how work needs to be done. Because people think you could kind of put on a Band-Aid and uh, solve everything. But that's not what experts are telling us. That's not what scientists are telling us we kind of understand that what's happening in the system that we have right now, um, neoliberalism, capitalism, it's not going to work um, in terms of uh, what we're looking for in the future and for us to be, have a livable future. So I want, that's very good. I want to use that as a segue in our conversation mm -hmm. here. Um, we've been talking about the problem a lot and it's a big problem. It's, uh, what I call a predicament as opposed to a problem. Problems have solutions, predicaments. There's no solution. All you can do is an adapt, uh, and find your best way through it. Um, so that there's, um, uh, it seems like both with young and old, more and more people through talking about it, through that educational piece are coming to that sort of personal epiphany moment. Um, uh, really kind of rocking the whole thing and understanding it. So then it becomes a question of, of what do we do? As we talk about it, as we educate people, um, and you understand it, here we are, we're still alive, uh, society's still moving ahead, but what do we actually do to address these? Uh, so Shalini, you'd mentioned disassembling the current systems so that... Uh, uh, and we talked earlier that it seems like um, using plastic straws isn't going to cut it. Yeah. Or even buying an electric vehicle isn't going to cut it. We need bigger kind of wholesale changes to how society functions. But where does that start? I want to bring that back to the local level. Um, mm -hmm. Where does that start with individuals, with their relationship to earth, to their mm -hmm. uh, fellow humans? Um, how do we begin kind of re-examining our relationship and, and the word that you used and the word that uh, is in Carney's book, responsibility. What mm -hmm. is our individual responsibility in the situation we find ourselves in? Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting to kind of talk about in individual um, epiphanies, perspectives, kind of uh, like the individual realm of things, because I think the main thing is finding that source in terms of connection and uh, understanding that it's not always like, it's not always a one-way street. It's more about understanding the reality of our, our situation, our experience through a lens, through a climate lens. So um, 
when I was talking to people, some people had uh, talked about contributing on behalf of art, whereas others want to contribute in terms of education. They had a uh, background in science, and so they were providing kind of the factual science side of things, where others were more focused on the communication of these facts. Um, and it's it it's I think it, it's important for us to understand that it's not just a one way, like, okay, today I decided that climate change is a thing and I want to make change, so I'm going to do A to Z. I don't think that's how it works. And I think um, it's kind of, it's it's kind of worked not in our favor by kind of uh, by saying the next steps are uh, X, Y, and Z. But it's I think we have to move towards a way where uh, we're letting people figure out how they can contribute on their own, um, understanding why they are responsible, and and more about looking at it as a collective. Like we are individuals, but we're working and we live and we are experiencing life as a collection. And I think that starts with being present uh, and having this presence and talking about this in every field. I think um, sometimes when we're chatting with people, they'll be like, oh, well, I'm an accountant. So like, I don't really care about this or you, that's your thing. But it's more about understanding where um, uh, this kind of um, this kind of discussion needs to be happening in diverse spaces where it's not happening. And I think individuals need to kind of sit back and reassess where they are at and how they can contribute. And with the understanding that it will always be different. Um, I don't know if that kind of provides so, an answer. Everybody finding their kind of their sweet spot, their their passion, their skill mm -hmm. base on how they can help. Now, Jim, you work with a lot of small local rural communities. How do you find people plugging in once they really start to understand things? That is the way to do it, is working at the local level. Uh, because Individuals at the local level, whether you start with a family. In fact, I read it in The Guardian this morning, a story about these climate cafes. But basically, um, individuals in a, while well, we're individuals in a community, we're all connected by that one community. And mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the work that I did was so powerful for me in working with uh, African Nova Scotia communities, indigenous communities and talking about climate change, they all shared common perspectives, even though individually they had different, um, you know, values, different cultural experiences, different levels of education. The common care for their home brought them together, that they all cared for their community. In fact, it really hit me, um, the, the first um, um, Indigenous community that I did, we were talking, and it came up that the Pope wrote an encyclical called Caring for the Common Home, which is Mother Earth. And that really resonated with, the, resonates with community. So the beauty of starting at the community level whether it be the family and the neighborhood and then the, the, the small town or the neighbor, whatever, that is where fundamentally uh, folks care for each other because that is their common home. They see that the local level is fundamentally, sure, I'm Canadian, I'm part of planet Earth, but fundamentally the people that I feel most connected to are the people in my community. And that is a wonderful way to start. Yeah, it's that uh, loyalty to place, I would call it. It seems like it's a real important underpinning on where to get started. Now, Bill, I know that you've done a lot of work on uh, the way forward, um, uh, which would involve relocalization in many ways, which of course speaks to local communities. Uh, can you say something about that? Yeah, let's try to put some numbers on this because we're talking about values, but we also have to talk about. I, I pegged you as the numbers guy, so we're, we're counting on that. All right, look, uh, even the IPCC and the Paris Accord says we need to 
decarbonize 50% within the next nine years if we're going to meet the Paris targets. Ours is a culture that is entirely dependent, in, particularly in a place like Canada, on fossil fuel. 83% of the primary energy on planet Earth is still fossil fuel. You cannot remove 50% of that in nine years because there are no substitutes. All we hear about wind and solar and so on, making huge strides in, in electricity generation, but electricity is 19% of final consumption and wind and solar provide only about 9% of that. So we have an enormous way to go. If we're gonna drop out of fossil fuels, we need a substitute, we don't have it. So if we're gonna avoid climate change, we have to get out of fossil fuels. And that means we have to get serious about reducing our overall energy and material throughput in our culture. And the numbers are something on the order of 48% or 45% globally. And that means 80% in first world countries like our own. So that is the reality of avoiding overshoot and with it, climate change. Now, how many people go to political meetings and hear politicians talking about the plans they have to reduce our energy and material consumption by 80% in, in North America? It, it's not going to happen. So we have to think about something else here. I am not a great fan of the individual's responsibility in this. There are studies to show that if we as individuals did just about everything we could, it would make maybe a three to 10% difference in, in carbon emissions, for example. This is a collective problem and the heavy lifting has to be undertaken on behalf of the whole community by our governments. So I, as an individual cannot impose a carbon tax, which most economists would argue is one of the most efficient ways of reducing the carbon emissions. I, as an individual, cannot ensure that my city has an adequate public transit system so that everyone doesn't have to drive an automobile. I could go on, but you get the point. The major things that have to be done have to be done by senior governments with the cooperation of us all at the community level. Now, as a consequence of failing energy over, we're going to have to relocalize. So it seems to me where communities and individuals become very important is in communicating the necessity of the kinds of changes that have to take place at the local and community level. Look, for the last 50 years of neoliberalism, we have dumped all of the responsibility onto individuals. And in the process, we've lost sight of a whole range of other values, such as self-reliance, such as a community, as such as local economic diversity. It's all been about specialization, specialization, uh, efficiency, efficiency. And in the process, we've forgotten all about the nature of strength at the community level, which resides in a sense of common purpose, in the sense of lo uh, loyalty to place. Someone mentioned this. It resides in a sense of, of economic security coming from the diversity that we can have at the local level, all of which has gone out the window in the last 40 or 50 years, but will return either because we want to solve this problem or because nature solves it for us and forces us back uh, to the local level. So look, individualism, important, but without the top-down, bottom-up approach simultaneously occurring, we're going to make no progress whatsoever. So the yeah. object, we have to become politically engaged as individuals to convince the politicians to do what is necessary to get us all through this crisis. And it's gonna take a hell of a lot more than most people think. We are far, far from understanding the extent to which we are dependent on energy and the extent to which change is going to occur if we hope to avoid um, climate change as one consequence of our, our extreme overshoot that we're involved in right now. You know, we're in the middle of a federal election here in Canada. Nova Scotia just had a provincial election I haven't heard any of the candidates talk about energy descent planning. It just doesn't happen. It's probably a good way to kill your political career if you bring it up. Um, and we had a discussion earlier. We joked about how the only good politicians are the ones that aren't intending to uh, run for office again because they could actually lean into the system and make some changes. Um, so, uh, you know, it's I know there's a lot of frustration by a heck of a lot of people 
trying to change politicians and trying to change political systems along the way. There's always seems to be a lot of window dressing, but very little meaningful action. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about the international climate accords and so on. Um, so are you saying, uh, Bill, that it's almost by default that we have to really look at building communities as a way to go forward? Or is there a uh, undiscovered way previously on how we can sway governments to do something meaningful? Look, I think community, that's where we live. We live in communities and the most important things in individual lives is our close relationships with relatives and friends, mainly at the community level. It's been a bit distorted by international travel and communications, but basically it comes down to forming communities, good solid groups of people who can work together for common purpose. But the biggest common purpose we have today on this planet is to confront the fact that we are literally, people don't get this, we are literally consuming the biophysical basis of our own existence, because there's too many of us demanding too much of the system. That is what we have to come to grips with. So how can we best get along together to share a great deal less in terms of the energy and material available at the community level? And I suggest mm -hmm. that uh, if we don't begin to think in those terms, we're going nowhere. This is, is going to uh, just overwhelm us and we'll reach the point where out of desperation, we'll be scrabbling and fighting each other for the remaining dregs of a sinking ship. Mm -hmm. So um, I remember not so eloquently as Bill has done, asking Catherine Hayhoe at that same dinner when she suggested I talk about it, we need to talk about it. I said, well, that's only gonna get us so far, Catherine. What, what do you really think is going to happen? She said, the holy shit moment. And that's when the collective, including the politicians and the senior business leaders realize, I do a lot of work with the insurance industry. They get it. That the cost of not doing something, it far exceeds the cost of doing something. And the longer we wait, the higher that cost gets. And this is where we're, I mean, talked about uh, opening up the Guardian this morning. Economic cost of climate change six times higher than previously thought. And that number is, on, I mean, Shahini talked, Shalini talked about this, that mm -hmm. the number of significant events just this summer with wildfires and floods and heat events that are killing people um, um, this is just enormous, incredible. And we've got a, a category four hurricane heading towards Newfoundland of all places, Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. um, so, so unfortunately, the, we, we're going to have to endure what we're enduring, but worse before some of these changes be made. But we're damn close, in my opinion. Uh, maybe I'm naively optimistic, but the costs of not doing something are enormously higher than doing something. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask Shalini what she thinks uh, is the prime motivator. I mean, people keep saying to me that I'm a pessimist, I don't have hope. I have lots of hope, but I have hope in a direction yeah. that they wouldn't even consider going. It seems to me, and I'm just gonna put this out exactly. there, really motivates people is having the shit scared out of them. <laughs> and until you're up to your knees yeah. in your living room in water, you ain't gonna take climate change seriously. But mm -hmm. by then, because of the lags and thresholds in the system, it's too late to do anything truly effective. So what you said exactly. is, is so important, Jim. If we don't act now, when we are finally scared into acting in a significant way at a, at a cultural level, it will be too late to save any remnants of society that you'd want to think about. Any mm -hmm. comments on that, Julie? Yes, yeah, so yeah, um, you mentioned that earlier. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, so in this conversation, I'm kind of reminded of um, a lecture I actually had by Professor Sarah Wolf, who studies terror management theory. And so she kind of looks at 
the understanding of like death and um, how that plays into the, uh, the climate crisis and work around climate. Um, people tend to, when something, when people are essentially scared, uh, like shitless, I guess, like, however you want to say it, they're just scared. They don't want to, they, they're they like kind of paralyzed in thought and action where they're like, well, what can we do now? And they kind of move on. And I've had these conversations with my mom where I'm like going off on uh, like small little rants and she's like, well, what can we do? But I look at her and I'm like, yes, you have the privilege of saying, what can we do? But I'm I'm still here. I'm gonna, I'm hoping to at least live for the past, for the next 60 years, maybe even 70. But um, it, it's, it's interesting to see how, uh, social dynamics really play into how we're acting and how uh, we affect change. When you talk about uh, communities, um, I think what's another important factor of when we talk about how important communities are is that governments work in four-year terms. They're, um, even, even if they understand an action today can have um, consequences that occur past four years, it's not their responsibility. And that's where responsibility ties in again, where in the end it does come down to communities because we're, we should be the stewards of our own community, our, our people, our land and everything. So I think that's something that uh, is very important. It, it has to be happening simultaneously as us pressuring governments. Um, like we talked about, for example, energy, when I was talking about uh, talking to city councillors, um, within the Waterloo region, they said, yes, we can do as much as we can, but in terms of the energy grids, it's a provincial, uh, it's under pro provincial jurisdiction. So if uh, the government, like we need policies and uh, policies to be able to support um, uh, what's going on. And so it's, it's, it's quite interesting um, to think about how uh, people view uh, this type of action that's needed. Um, and, uh, oh, another, uh, another point that I wanted to make is when we were talking about consumption is that, uh, there's also another like social aspect to consumption and how people view success. Um, in, I think historically we've kind of understood the fact of like, oh, if you have more, that means you've, you've reached a point of success and, and life's good. And that's how we're about, that's how um, we're going to live life. For example, my family immigrated from Sri Lanka. And for us, um, I've heard a couple of like family members say, oh, like, you know what, it's fine. Like, you don't have to turn on the lights. I'm good with that. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a social status um, that is like an underpinning how we view consumption, for example, which is a big thing. And, and I think unless we're able to disassemble and kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? disassemble that type of social hierarchy in terms of consumption. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think that's the first step at least with, um, with affecting the change that's required in that uh, sense of things. Um, but yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> now I, I want to get it in, uh, we're running uh, short on time here, but I want to get into something that I think is a quite interesting underlying thread to what we're talking about here. Um, there's a certain capacity of human spirit to think that we can fix things. That somehow if we mobilize, we do it quickly enough at large enough scale, we can pull through and solve things. Compared to systems just collapsing, falling apart, which you alluded to, Bill, um, and things happening on their own, sort of mother nature taking over, so to speak. Um, and it strikes me, we might be in a situation where there's going to be a little bit of both that take place. And um, that's particularly, Shalini, you mentioned disassembling systems. Well, we can do it actively, volitionally, mm -hmm. or they will disassemble themselves, uh, in which case we can look beyond that. How do we rebuild? How do we plant seeds for what comes mm -hmm. next? And I, I think that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit towards the end here is how do we plant seeds for what comes next? <laughs> Listen, I think you've made some really important points. Uh, but the main thing to keep in mind here is that the, the, we're embedded in a culture whose leaders are dedicated to conserving the culture as it is today. 
It's called Modern Techno-Industrial Society. So if we look at the IPCC and the Paris Accord and the discussions around it, they're primarily set up not to really address climate change, but to maintain the status quo by other means. So the values at play are the values that have created the problem, which is why I keep saying climate change is only one symptom of this much deeper crisis that evolves from the value systems at, at play here, the overshoot crisis. So here's what happens. We go in to the negotiations with the kind of hope you talked about. We can affect things, which is necessary for human survival. You know, if we weren't optimistic, we would have died out a long time ago. But if you go in with the kinds of values we have now, the only things on the table are those things that require massive capital investment, wind towers, solar panels, EVs, uh, as yet undeveloped uh, capture and or carbon capture and storage technologies. And if you read the literature here, it's all about job creation and maintaining the economic growth uh, through the future uh, using these new technologies and so on and so forth. So here we are trying to solve one of the symptoms of the real problem using exactly the issues or, or approaches that have caused the problem in the first place. More use of more materials to maintain the system. It's really the status quo or what I like to think of as business as usual by alter, alternative means. But it's still business as usual. It will not solve climate change and it's going to deepen the overshoot crisis. That's the problem. So we have to start over. It means abandoning the fundamental beliefs, values, and assumptions of neoliberal techno-industrial societies and resurrecting a new kind of culture uh, that involves completely different values. Abandon growth for equity, for example. Abandon the faith in, in, in technology for the faith in human capacity to love, to cherish, to work cooperatively together with limited means to create a culture of enoughness. Now that language is completely hostile and foreign to everything uh, that our political system and, and economic system and, and corporate system is dedicated toward. But if you don't do these things, we're not gonna solve this problem. Those were the kind of seeds I was talking about. Okay, exactly. we need to have a global society of fewer people living um, more, uh, on less material and energy, more equitably within the biocapacity of the ecosphere. That's all it is. That's what sustainability is. It's not yeah. difficult to articulate, but until we get that in our heads and start moving toward it, we will continue to erode the biophysical basis of our own existence and climate catastrophe is one of the major symptoms. But so is biodiversity loss and all the other things that are you know, pushed off the table because we've had a pandemic, which, by the way, is another symptom of overshoot. But we, we, we could uh, <laughs> spend a day Thank on that. Jim, any final thoughts on this? Uh, um... Well, I, you know, I, I certainly um, believe, perhaps, trust in human ingenuity and the resilience of the human, the human beast. I mean, certainly, it's our ingenuity that got us into this mess. I reflect on the pandemic, you know, Bill talked about the pandemic. The plans were in place. It was well known. This was going to happen. And when it did happen, the plans were ignored. And so in a smaller scale, or maybe an equally large scale, but a rapid scale, the pandemic, but what, who would have believed that in less than a year, a new vaccine was developed that actually was 90% effective and they can manufacture millions and millions, not enough, of these vaccines. Mm -hmm. Incredibly, mRNA, who knows, knew what mRNA was? I didn't. And this is amazing. This is every, everyday talk now. And so you, in one sense, it gives you hope because there was an enormous amount of resources put together to make that happen quickly. Of course, how many anti-vaxxers are out there? There aren't believing it. They're taking horse pills and whatever else. Uh, but who would have believed that 650,000 Americans are dying in a pandemic? 
many of which who don't believe that COVID is even exists. It's, I'm still hopeful. I do think we have the ingenuity, but as you said, there are going to be, Bill, as we see with the pandemic, there are costs, human costs. Okay. And we do have the, we do have the ingenuity, but there will be a cost, unfortunately. It, it took the threat of death millions. Can I hinge on our ingenuity? Shalini, any closing <laughs> thoughts? Um, yeah, to what Bill had talked about earlier, I think what kind of gives on, uh, it, with that conversation, what kind of gives me hope is understanding that those who benefit from this current system don't want it obviously to be um, disassembled. People want it to up upkeep the system because obviously they're benefiting from it. And they, the people, those who benefit from the system tend to hold uh, a lot of power when it comes to decision-making. And I, so something that kind of gives me comfort is understanding that those who benefit and those who hold this power, that's, it's not necessarily a big number of people that are there. And I feel like when we have that understanding going into um, whether it's like a delegation group at your city council or um, going into, or any work that you're doing, I think understanding that power is always fluid and that we can change how it's, uh, who holds it and how it's kind of um, created. I think that kind of gives me hope with the understanding that obviously the change that is required, it, it needs to be radical. And there's some type of, um, there's some type of hope with what we've seen um, with the pandemic and kind of the global outcry and human and understanding uh, uh, humans as a collective and humanity as a whole. Um, that's kind of what gives me hope um, amongst all this doom. Not to say that there isn't any doom, but amongst all of it, that's what gives me hope. Okay, thank you. Fluid, fl the fluidity of the power system and really understanding that uh, mm -hmm. might be helpful. Tell me, uh, tell me a major difference between the liberals and the conservatives or the Democrats and the Republicans. And, you know, it's a, they're the same party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're making the same values. So we, we have a huge political problem here. Exactly. I agree with your basic assessment, but we have to recognize that the changes that were uh, are available to us through the democratic process That's true. are That's absolutely not. limited because we're all holding mm -hmm. to the same value set. That's well, true. I, yeah. I do want to thank all of you. Unfortunately, we're out of time and clearly we could keep going for a very long time. This has been a fantastic discussion. I appreciate everyone's input, and your energy and comments. We covered an enormous amount of ground in one hour. Um, I want to thank you for that. Uh, with all of the listeners, I want to encourage you to sign up to our newsletter so you can stay abreast of what's coming up in the future. Um, there will be another one hour webinar discussion on Monday, September 13th, about bringing these global realities into the classroom We've got three academic professors on both the nuclear uh, threat arena as well as climate change. Uh, so we'll be covering both of those. And also uh, keep an eye out for our feature articles. Uh, one of them that's been released is particularly on climate grief. And we've got two others coming up soon. Check those out on our website. And there will be other events at uh, and during the summit. Um, we're just working out the details on those and hope to be announcing them in the near future. So do pay attention. And finally, um, I would like to say that uh, you're very welcome to make donations to the Center for Local Prosperity so we can continue this type of work. We can provide tax receipts in Canada and also in the U.S. as well. So please uh, contact us about that um, if you're interested. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I'd like to thank our three speakers for the excellent discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.